Um, look, I think people need to understand um, the nature of Hamas and the nature of its terrorist uh, infrastructure and capabilities. Uh, and I think there's a disconnect because many people seem to have uh, gotten to the point, certainly in the years since 2007, when Hamas took over the Gaza Strip by force of arms, pointing its weapons, shooting its weapons at fellow Palestinians, that Hamas had somehow changed, uh, that it was no longer a group committed to uh, a violent jihad, uh, that it was somehow more representative of Palestinians in general. Certainly, that's, that's its propaganda. Uh, it is not. Um, and that what it was really about was continued siege of Gaza um, um, and occupation, and as it likes to say, uh, whenever it gets a chance, defending Jerusalem. In fact, this this uh, uh, series of terrorist attacks was was named uh, the Al Aqsa Flood. In fact, uh, in the years since Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, it found itself in a position to do things it never before thought that it could limited until then with suicide bombings, targeting buses or cafes, shooting attacks, um, uh, types of things that it is really only still capable, uh, limited to in the West Bank. And the Gaza Strip, it realized that if it played a long game, it could build up an infrastructure, the likes of which most terrorist groups don't get to build by virtue of controlling space, having an effective safe haven being able to build up a, a, a storage of small arms, a uh, collection of, uh, in the early days imported and in the years since, um, domestically produced rockets and projectiles that can go various lengths, some of them quite far into uh, northern the West Bank, certainly as we've seen today, Tel Aviv, and to build up a cadre of fighters that they could use in large numbers at a future date. Uh, the many people who thought that Hamas would be co-opted by governance, that it would be too busy collecting garbage and paying the salaries of school teachers to be fully committed to uh, fighting Israel in a large-scale war, who thought that Hamas would be deterred by virtue of the fact that there would likely be a significant Israeli retaliation, have been proven wrong in a very painful and bloody way. And so today we need to look at Hamas as a militant and terrorist group, not only as one that can carry out your standard terrorist attacks, but as one that could successfully deploy at least a thousand people into uh, Israel in coordinated attacks, an organization that successfully led a disinformation campaign, uh, convincing Israel not only that it could be deterred and that as long as money came in and there were jobs, just last week, Israel allowed an additional number of workers to come into Israel from the Gaza Strip, that, that things could be calm, uh, having riots at the fence and using those as cover, shootings in the West Bank, making people think that was the totality of what it was going to do uh, to play a long game. Um, I think it's important to remind Hamas is not about occupation. It's not about the lack of a two-state solution. Hamas opposes a two-state solution. Hamas is about creating an Islamist state in all of historic Palestine to include the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and all of Israel. It's about the destruction of Israel. And that's something I think a lot of people have, uh, have lost sight of. Uh, the Israeli Air Force, as Ehud said, is going to be focused right now on trying to uh, destroy as much of their military capability as possible. And that will, of course, involve those that are uh, shooting rockets, but also uh, Hamas defensive capabilities. And here I think it's important to remember the Hamas tunnel system, not the one that was built into Egypt for smuggling and not the one that was dug into Israel before an underground fence prevented those back in the day so that Hamas, back when it was planning an earlier version of this week's attacks, I'm talking about the tunnels domestically within the Gaza Strip that Hamas built specifically so that when the day came that they were able to draw Israel to a ground fight in the Gaza Strip, they would be able to pop up from places unannounced and ambush soldiers. Um, there's also the American angle here, and Rob mentioned this briefly. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, the most serious attack targeting Americans uh, since 9-11 uh, abroad. And we don't have the full numbers. The White House said we know of 11 uh, Americans killed. Uh, the likelihood that that number increases is, is painfully high. And we don't know the number, but we do know that there were Americans who were kidnapped uh, into the Gaza Strip. 
Uh, the FBI will be uh, opening up uh, cases for through, their, through their extraterritorial squad for every American that was a victim of uh, this series of attacks, whether people killed, injured, terrified, whether they you know escaped, and and of course those who who are kidnapped and will be providing intelligence support to the Israelis. So I imagine that that will be the limit on this issue because the Israelis know what they're doing and and will not need uh, more U.S. support and are famous for saying that they're not going to ask someone else to fight for them. Um, but because there are Americans that are held hostage still, you can imagine that the U.S. intelligence and law enforcement communities are going to be looking at this very, very closely. They will be looking at things domestically, too. Not that I think that there's any type of Hamas threat in this country. In a militant sense, I don't. But you don't need to look far on social media already to see very violent and hateful uh, rallies uh, that uh, not only include potential hate crimes, but violence in cities across the United States. And that's going to take the attention of law enforcement as well. We're going to have later opportunities this week to talk more broadly about the likelihood of horizontal escalation, whether it's from Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hezbollah and other Shia militants from Syria, the potential for Houthi missiles at Eilat from the south. But I think it's important here to underscore something Ehud said. I think the likelihood that Hamas decided to take this series of actions, knowing that the Israelis would have to retaliate in a very significant way, is it's unlikely in the extreme that they would do this without the belief that if push came to shove, other elements of what we call the Iran threat network and what they call the axis of resistance would come to their defense to create other fronts in this war. Whether or not that happens remains to be seen. The West Bank is fairly quiet right now. East Jerusalem is fairly quiet right now. There's been stuff happening on the northern border, but frankly, less than many of us might have expected. Uh, but that certainly is uh, Hamas's hope. Finally, I, I think we need to recognize that this does change everything. Anybody who expects that the response to an attack like this is going to be like previous responses deeply misunderstands the nature of this attack and the nature of its psychological impact on Israel. Yes, Israel will have to reassert deterrence and Israel will have to convince its own population and others, as Rob said, of its capabilities. But it's much more than that. And at the end of the day, when we come out of the tunnel of the immediate threat that we are in right now, there might be some opportunities. I think that if I were sitting in Riyadh or if I were sitting in Abu Dhabi, and if I were sitting in Jerusalem, one of my big takeaways now, and I think it will still be the case in several weeks, is... <laughs> that the regional moderates really do have a lot to be afraid of from Iran and its proxies. And their interest in joining forces for a lot of positive reasons having nothing to do with Iran, but also because of a desire to share intelligence, information, technology, counter drone technology, and, and, and more is very, very real. And I think that in the long run, Iran and Hezbollah, and most certainly Hamas, have only driven